Welcome to Northwest Profiles, a look at people, places, and events of interest in the inland Northwest. Lewis and Clark High School. On the surface, it appears to be like any other high school. Yet, a closer look reveals something more, something special. From its historic cornerstone to its fabled clock tower, Lewis and Clark is clearly more than just a high school. In many ways, it's a testament to our region's proud past. It is, in essence, a time capsule, because a walk through Lewis and Clark is a walk through the 20th century. Okay, squeeze on in for a minute. On this morning, former Lewis and Clark student, now teacher and resident building historian Bob Lobdell, conducts a guided tour of the building. Over the years, the Lewis and Clark tour has become a tradition. The tour is given to incoming freshmen to provide them with a sense of what makes their high school something special. From time to time, we'll join the tour. But first, let's wander back for a moment. Lewis and Clark's history began in the fall of 1883, when on the same site as the current school, a small wooden building known as Spokane High School was opened. It was called The School, because it was the only school in Spokane. And it had, uh, oh, but. 20 faculty members at its largest when it was ready to be torn down because it was outgrown and then South Central was built on this site. Dedicated in 1891, South Central served the south end of Spokane for 19 years. Then on June 20th, 1910, fire broke out. In less than four hours, South Central was totally destroyed. Ten months later, however, the third high school built on the same site would officially open. Its name would be Lewis and Clark. The opening was highlighted by the appearance of former President Theodore Roosevelt. If you can just stop and imagine now. Stop. All right, squeeze on in. Right here is our cornerstone. The cornerstone, if you stop and think today, it was 80 years ago, a little over 80 years ago, that Teddy Roosevelt was standing where some of you may have been standing. And that picture that we looked at in the office, the needless to say, it would have been in the afternoon. Of course, it had been a lot warmer. Since then, there's been a lot of developments through the building. The original building was built at approximately a cost of $300,000. With all this Virginia marble, with all of the oak and so on, all the way through the building. Probably to try to replace this building with the existing type of facilities, marble, oak, all brick and so on. They really can't put a uh, total dollar out. It's probably 20 to 25 million dollars because of labor costs. Designed by L.L. L. Rand, a foremost architect of the time, Lewis and Clark's Tudor Gothic design was highlighted by a generous use of marble throughout the building. It was this unique feature that made the school a marvel of architecture when it opened for classes in the fall of 1912. When the building was first built, of course, it was the most modern structure west of the Mississippi. They had an old steam, they had steam, uh, a steam plant, I guess you'd call it, with, with the, mower, the motors and all, that, that cleaned, cleansed, and washed the air every 15 minutes in this whole building. And in 1910 and 1911, that was quite a renovation. We've got an awful lot of unique features. And one thing that uh, a lot of people don't pay much attention to, but over the front doors and the different doors, you'll see gargoyles and figures of theaters. It was always traditional until recent years that public buildings and theaters all had gargoyles to ward away evil spirits. Along with its many architectural attributes, the new Lewis and Clark was also a state-of-the-art teaching facility, boasting both an aquarium that at one time held 300 brook trout and a conservatory. Meanwhile, in the basement, the school sported a swimming pool. Unfortunately, the pool was later closed and eventually boarded over following a flu epidemic in the early 1930s. 
Another dazzling feature of Lewis and Clark was its elegant auditorium. Unique features about this auditorium, besides the stage having two prosceniums, all these yellow tiles. The yellow tiles are covering windows. This used to be one of the most beautifully naturally lit auditoriums because they used to have hanging baskets of ferns and so on. And you could come in here and actually really see. It's awful dark in here right now. But with these things uncovered, they had tremendous light. Today, still gracing the stage end of the auditorium, are two priceless oil paintings. The two portraits of Meriwether Lewis and William Clark were given to the school by its first graduating class in 1912. We have the original letter that was sent by Meriwether Lewis's grand niece commissioning the artist to paint the uh, tour explorers in typical officer's uh, uniform situation. And that letter was dated, I believe, in 1903. While much of Lewis and Clark's history centers around the building, it's important to note it's people who shape and mold an institution's worth. That's certainly true of Lewis and Clark, where several people have played an important part in the school's history. Two of the most prominent were E.L. Squinty Hunter and Henry M. Hart. Hart was the school's first principal from 1911 to 1936. He kind of established Lewis and Clark. Uh, since he graduated from Princeton, he decided that Lewis and Clark, well, he decided that the tiger should be the motto, and he decided that orange and black should be the colors because that was Princeton. And he thought Lewis and Clark's expedition was so great that this would be an ideal name for the school. And he was a as I say, a strong academician. Unlike any other high school in the country, the evidence of Henry Hart's flair for academics still remains highly visible throughout the marble hallways of Lewis and Clark. He wanted to develop an artistic building with educational values that were unsurpassed. And so he encouraged every senior class, encouraged all the monies he could raise with little convocations and things to purchase these, this very invaluable today, art collection. While the art collection at Lewis and Clark showcased Henry Hart's value as an educator, it proved his value as a fundraiser as well. Under the steady influence of Henry Hart, the student body raised through various activities enough money to purchase this authentic pipe organ for the auditorium. Made of solid oak, the organ was purchased in 1924 at a cost of $23,000. The addition of the organ to the school was a significant one. But for Henry Hart and his student body, it was just the beginning. The other thing that uh, Henry Hart is very famous for in fundraising, he made the greatest real estate deal probably this city will ever see. Students raised money again. They paid tw another $25,000, raising the money the same way to buy Hart Field, 44 acres. Henry Hart's role in shaping Lewis and Clark's tradition was a major one. So too was E.L. Squinty Hunters. Considered the greatest high school basketball coach in the history of Washington State, Squinty Hunter coached at Lewis and Clark for 40 years. During that time, Squinty's teams won 21 city titles, 23 state playoff games, and three state championships. Yet the legend of Squinty Hunter involved more than just winning basketball games. He was uh, our image, so to speak. We could have ended up, you know, in trouble or anything else if he hadn't got us interested and involved us in athletics. And then, not only athletics, sportsmanship was one thing that he absolutely preached. He taught you far more than basketball. He taught you a way of life, discipline, being able to work with each other. And I know he always taught us that you win with pride and lose with dignity. And I think we had an awful lot of proud Tigers over 40 years because we won a far more than we ever lost. From its celebrated building to its colorful people, Lewis and Clark is indeed more than just a high school. But with its history dating back to the turn of the century, Lewis and Clark is old. It's a fact that leads many to conclude the school should be replaced. On the other hand, there are many more who feel Lewis and Clark's age isn't a detriment, but rather is precisely what keeps it vital. I think we, just like all the schools in our city, are, are really striving to look at what is the, the mission and the goal of this school and this community, you know, in the 1990s, and where are we going with these young people? And I think the tradition of this school enhances and helps that.